Hey, time for another DraftPhysics.com, DebatePhysics.com, also video presentation and such comments, and there haven't been much, and there's one, okay, that's worth responding to, uh, but you can't, uh, I mean, it's just YouTube. Okay, so when I look at my whole channel comments, the comment isn't there, so it isn't in any spam folder or anywhere on the it's just not there it doesn't show yet on the video okay that um, I made uh, yeah the comments there so uh, but you have to hit newest first to see it but it's pretty pretty irritating that <laughs> YouTube wouldn't doesn't throw com all the comments in the channel comment viewer so the fact that there's comments that I can't see there that are still on videos is pretty bothersome but anyway it's just another youtube feature so he says this is the blue underwear the blue underwear oh okay <laughs> yeah uh, yeah anyway the earth is not hot for two reasons the earth is hot because of two reasons <laughs> All right. Um, first, when the planet was formed, so he actually thinks there was heat created in the Earth millions of years ago, billions, and uh, it's stuck. Can't get out. Can't get, you know, there's no such thing, frankly. Okay, I mean, everything that's warm or has any temperature ends up radiating infrared radiation. It will, you can take a picture of it, so to speak. You can take a picture of the fact that it's warm because it is giving off radiation. It's losing its heat to pushing into the universe. So that's just silly. Um, gravitational potential energy turned into heat. So he's conceding one part of the argument that somehow gravitational potential energy turned into heat. So the idea of gravity giving objects all mass force into that is momentum into the earth I mean the fact is is when you sit on a scale it's showing you the momentum you're pushing on the earth with now I know you're gonna say I'm not moving yeah you are you just can't see the movement that is more of you is pushing down than is you know lifting back up in a sense you have to hit the earth first. The earth has to push you back to your original position. And then you go into the earth again. It pushes you back again. So you're always pushing into the earth. So even the matter that already, you know, like a meteor crashes into the earth, it doesn't stop pushing. So it pushed when it crashed. It took all of the energy, crashed into the earth. And now it's matter on the surface of the earth and it's still pushing on the center. And a push is the same thing as heat. So he's conceding the argument there, and um, but pretending it only happened, a, whatever, four billion years ago, when, no, it's happening right now, it's happening all the time. Uh, gravity is converted into a hot core of the Earth. All of the pressure goes right towards the middle, and that has a conflict there, but it also conflicts all the way going out too. The heat is constantly trying to get out and can't, so you know, it's just more heat coming in, more pressure. The pressure coming in is equalizing the pressure going out to an extent, and so it slows it down getting out, but it gets out. And it's always constantly being created at that rate. All right, if you drop an object to the ground, same thing happens. You create hit, heat. So, <laughs> yeah, you, you don't, again, just dropping it is only part of the heat. All right, gravity itself is not constantly heating the planet, so that's just a nonsense. It can't do it any other way. It's either a constant force, as they all say it is, or it's not. So what you just said is really dumb and ignorant and you're a pretentious douchebag to sit there and claim you know the truth and you have some facts when obviously you can't say it's not a constantly heating it can't do it any other way it's a constant force it wasn't a different force four billion years ago than it is today it's the same force today 
All right. There's no free energy. So obviously there is. You can see, it. even if I just take your argument from the beginning, gravitational potential energy turned into heat. You said it happened 4 billion years ago. So that's free energy there. But the real point is it's happening all the time, constantly. If we cut, if we stopped gravity tomorrow, first the planet would fly apart. <laughs> you know, but what would happen is, is there'd be a lot of heat that would escape. Everything is at a, it has a temperature Kelvin. Relative to zero temperature, the Earth is really hot. It's really hot relative to zero. You know, 200 or something, 250, it's some sort of number. Um, and uh, the surface. And, and that's just a fact. You know, and you're declaring something else to be a fact with no reasoning or logic, and you contradicted yourself in your own statement. All right, decay of radioactive materials. Again, no free energy. So, so this is another thing they say, but they don't really have any evidence of it. The radiation coming from inside the Earth isn't some huge amount compared to coming from outside the Earth. Um, you know, it's not like you point the, you know, detector in different directions and you get different amounts. And um, the radioactivity is another one of those things where it tends to produce more radioactivity when it's in a material. So if you have radioactivity inside of a material, it's hard to shield against it. Um, because you end up making the material that you're using as a shield radioactive. <coughs> you know, it just tends to happen that way. Even if you had lead, lead wouldn't last millions of years as a container. So there's no way that the radioactivity is the source of the heat of the Earth. You don't get up to, whatever, 4,000 degrees uh, on radioactivity. Yeah, if gravity works the way you think it does, why can't we build a gravity mill? So again, <laughs> there's nothing about my theory that predicts that there's any such thing as easier to pick something up than it is to drop something kind of thing. So there's no way to gain whatever this extra is. Like a water wheel with one half covered by a high mass object functioning as a gravity umbrella. So you know how heavy the high mass thing would have to be to be an umbrella. The Earth is gigantic. The only way you could block the gravity the Earth is creating is just to create more gravity. So if I wanted to equalize the gravity on the surface of the Earth and make everybody buoyant, I'd have to have another Earth. The same size, another Earth, right, you know, 10 feet above you. <laughs> and then you could float in between the two planets before they smashed into each other and crushed you like a bug. Which, of course, is what you deserve. And, and the other half collecting gravity, making the wheel spin. So, you, know, you, you can't shield gravity except with gigantic amounts of mass. Gigantic amounts. So, duh, stupid comment. You're an asshole. Okay, can I get a patent for it? Well, you can't, obviously. Oh, God, you people are just so obnoxious. So there's no way I can... Yeah, I can't even block this asshole. That's pretty irritating. So I have to actually put his name into, <laughs> you know, the block list to, to block him. I mean, I'd rather just delete his comment, but since I can't do that either, um, I can't sign in and view comments, you know, on a video. So YouTube is just trying to fuck me, um, you know, to um, interfere with the production of these videos in any way it can. Uh, and, um, you know, it's just such bullshit. So, yeah, that's really it. <laughs> yeah, so, comments are really thin. So this video might not be published for a while. As I'll wait until there's some more stuff to say and such. So, till the next time, whenever that will be, blah, 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 blah. All right, I'm back. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Uh, so there really aren't any other comments to speak of. So I guess I figured I will do a little bit on physicist Michael. It's been a while. Six months since he posted anything. So, um, you know, last we the story ends sort of with the fact that he was going to make the, you know, one mass to three mass 
Newton's Cradle in a large format and um, prove that you can create free momentum and resolve the issue once and for all and uh, he had some problems stabilizing it and this and that but you know it was going to get done and it didn't get done and so it all ended right there in terms of any conversation relevant to my contentions that the uh, you know all your foundations of all your physics are absolute rubbish and you're all cowards because you won't defend uh, <laughs> your physics against those arguments um, no matter how um, crass and unpleasant I might be and um, it shouldn't matter to a scientist um, where the um, arguments are coming from or who's making them or any of that kind of garbage it should just matter that okay there's a contention made that uh, there's a conflict between kinetic energy and momentum that it isn't some compatible logical um, circumstance to have these two mechanisms identified essentially as a form or type of energy and um, when they get completely different answers in different circumstances when something as simple as landing on the moon um, where you have to just shoot a little bit of thrust out to get your s spacecraft into the right um, what they call it orientation um, and that there's a, a real factual calculation you can calculate the thrust as kinetic energy or you can calculate the thrust as momentum and you'll get two different answers for how much energy is being produced and how much you can expect as a reaction uh, from your ship and the argument is is that in that case momentum is proven to be the, the more solid definition because it does obey Newton's third law where kinetic energy doesn't so you can shoot a whole bunch of kinetic energy out and the fact is just like the ballistic pendulum proves the only energy you can collect that is the only opposite reaction you're going to get is the momentum um, and that that sort of demonstrates it's the real thing and that the kinetic energy crap is just that crap it doesn't it's not any kind of real energy it can't do real work in the universe and that every single time you make transfers of energy between heavy things and light things uh, you'll get a broken definition of energy in the sense that momentum will not agree with kinetic energy alright so this was something we had started over a year ago and um, you know he made his videos where he was saying he's proving kinetic energy is what's stored in springs and he's proving this and proving that and they're kind of um, you know, detailed analysis required. Um, he's, you know, using a lot of computer software to do all the analysis and this and that. So just figured I would go back and do a couple of those and just show the fact that the results are, as they continue to be in physics, inconsistent and um, in, inconsistent with res resolution it doesn't resolve anything because there's a flaw okay and it's observable and definable and establishable and that's not the right one uh, let's see is this the right one no <laughs> yeah it's got to be one of these let's see if this one's nope that's still one of Gosling's wacky experiments yeah the the height difference you know anyway uh, there, that's the one I'm looking for. All right, so um, so in one of the experiments, he's just doing the simple Professor Lewin um, air track experiment, except he's using these carts manufactured by a company to sell to teachers, so they don't have to do any work. <laughs> you know, and it also just, you know, they have the taxpayers' money to waste. Uh, you know, way overpaying for a, you know, a piece of garbage, frankly. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> and um, let's see if I can make sure I have that selected so I can enlarge it where necessary. Uh, so he does two experiments. So one, it's a one mass cart, essentially, against a two mass cart. Um, not perfect, but close enough. And he collides them. All right. And so in one experiment, he's using repulsive magnets. In the other experiment, he's using a spring between the carts. 
So you just have a still two mass. You crash a one mass into it with some velocity. This goes off this way. This rebounds a little bit. And so we have the two experiments here. <clears throat> and uh, use my little arrow. Uh, selecting. i got to find a better way to select things. Um, so this one, this experiment, is the... Uh, which one is this? Okay, this one is the magnets, and this one's the spring. And um, this black line here is the momentum line. All right. And um, as you can see, there's a pretty good gap here where you've made free momentum. So anything above that black line is free momentum. And um, so that's one way of seeing it. Um, and you can see the difference in the two experiments. In this experiment, no, there's just almost nothing above the black line. So in the spring experiment, the result was a lot less than, you know, the 133 you're supposed to get. So you start with 100 momentums, you get 133 in the two mass carts. So you've increased the amount of momentum for free, frankly. And that's why I call it the free energy experiment or the free momentum experiment because, wow, that's a... You know, people should be taking note that you can make free momentum because, frankly, free momentum is weight, it's pressure, it can do work. The fact is, momentum does do work. All right. <clears throat> In every case, it always works at doing work. All right. It's kinetic energy that fails to show up when, you know, and punch its clock and do its work. It's kinetic energy that fails dismally to be able to produce the extra work it claims to have, the capacity to do. All right, and you can see clearly very different results. And what the difference is, okay, if you're, all right, let me let me um, enlarge it uh, just so you can see more clearly that there is a distinct difference. So here's the black line is the momentum line. This is the increase in momentum. You have some down here and you have some down here. So obviously if you add up both directions and count both directions as momentum, it's 166. So you start with 100, you have 166 coming out. And you're close to that result with the magnets. But with the springs, nope, didn't happen. Uh, just a little bit above the momentum line, a little bit below down here. So instead of 166, you got like 110. So a tiny increase. And the difference between the two experiments is the magnet experiment, the velocity was 25% or 20% higher. So the higher the velocity going in, the more likely it is you're going to produce this extra momentum output. And the slower the velocity, the less likely you're to see it. And I have argued that you can understand why it happens that way. Um, without really hurting yourself much. Okay, so let me get rid of all this stuff we don't need. And I need the camera. So I shall draw. Um, we don't need the arrow. Come on, select the frickin' arrow. I do have to figure that out anyway. It's a, it's a kind of a nuisance. Ah, too many Mises. I got you know, the desk, the desk. It's always getting cluttered. I can't stop it from happening somehow. All right, so the problem is, is the carts. All right, so the carts, let's say it only has three wheels, um, and I'm assuming it has an axle, and the axle is sort of an important thing because there's where you can really understand this effect. So just say this is your cart sitting on this wheel train, okay? And the point is, is that when you give this motion, part of the motion will be caught up in this rotation. So the mostly just the up and down movement, but you can sort of understand that there's motions in this wheel that are real momentum. That all of this matter is moving not only this way, but it has a bunch of other motions in it. Okay, so. It's not only got this arrow going this way for the mass of the wheel and the mass of the axle, it's also got motions going up and motions going down, so it's got a lot of other directional angular momentum. And so it's storing energy. And so you can really understand if you think about the axle spinning, because 
it's just obvious that um, the hunk of metal is, um, you know, it's going to have all these little atoms inside of it are going to be doing all of this rotating and all of that is storing energy and you won't see it in the motion this way and the faster I spin that axle the more energy it stored so you can understand if the axle wasn't on the ground touching anything and I was just spinning it you could understand the faster I spin the mass the more energy it would have and I have to put it in with something something has to give it the energy so all of this energy the energy of the mass spinning the energy it takes to spin the mass all of that energy has to come out of your linear um, velocity so you have to to spin this you have to reduce your linear velocity so you'll be measuring a velocity but part of that velocity we could do that in a different color is part of your total energy is this part the part rotating here inside the wheels so the wheels contain a bunch of momentum that you can't see as a linear velocity but if you bang it into something all of this energy will be converted into forward pressure because that's the way it's actually moving okay <laughs> even though it's going up and down because of the trap it's in it can only give its energy okay as forward motion or pressure so it will push okay as if it was a velocity forward when it's just a spinning velocity it still has a pushing force forward so you can collect it when you hit something so the fact is is when he throws the cart the initial velocity is high okay and it's got a large percentage that's in the power of the wheels and what he's doing is when he hits the second cart he's converting or changing that relationship because the other cart is going to be spinning the wheels less so less of the energy is going to be in the wheels and more of the energy is going to be in the linear motion so the linear motion will be higher and the wheel percentage will be lower so I guess we could say it goes in let's say this way <clears throat> that percentage and when he hits a heavier cart he's going to get this more a higher percentage is going to be now in the linear motion and a smaller percentage of the energy is going to be in the rotation of the wheels and so that's why he can have the illusion of creating free momentum because what he actually did was just change the ratio of how much energy was stored in the wheels and how much was in the actual linear motion so they had the same momentum it's just that one you can't see it by looking at the linear velocity because it's hidden in the wheels and then the second case less of it's hidden in the wheels so you see more of it in the linear velocity so you're measuring a linear velocity only okay and so then you get this you know you get this ain't right <laughs> okay where these two lines aren't the same size um, and that looks like you got more energy but it's because you didn't see this part this part wasn't visible and that's the part where you change the proportions so all of these experiments can ex be explained by that so I could argue when he does a second set of experiments and he gets these other again um, irrational <laughs> you know it's irrational numbers what the hell is that's going to bother me I dropped the top to the pen uh, anyway uh, I have to get some new colors I think something brighter uh, darker something something anyway um, so he does another experiment where he just has the same spring and um, you know he's just going to launch two one things and then he's going to launch two two masses. All right. All right. And now logic says, okay, the spring has a certain capacity. <clears throat> and he actually titled the video something like uh, kinetic energy is stored in springs, not momentum. And I would argue that it's that's an absolute nonsense because weight is momentum 
it obeys Hooke's law. There's this, you know, you can't you can't change how much energy the spring can produce in terms of momentum. It always has to produce the same amount of momentum. Uh, unless you put something so light that the spring can't push it because the spring can't move fast enough to push it. But other than outside those limits, the spring is always going to produce the same amount of motion, okay, in terms of quantity of motion, the same amount of mass and velocity total. But when he did the experiment, okay, he got a number like, say, 1,500, you could say, for that, and he got 2,200 for this. So somehow the total momentum of stuff moving increases if you go with heavier objects than with lighter objects. And again, the argument is so obvious that with the lighter objects, okay, they were going at a much faster ve velocity, twice as fast, in fact, more than twice as fast, um, than the uh, heavy uh, objects. So the heavy objects, small velocity arrow, but you could understand that it's again the same scenario where, you know, the lighter objects, oh, I did that a little bit backwards, my mistake. Uh, the lighter objects had a higher component stored in the velocity of the wheels, okay? And it was a lower component stored in the velocity of the wheels with the heavier objects. And so that's what made the difference in these two numbers is when you launch the heavy things, you were putting less energy into rotating the axle and the wheels. And when you did the light object at nearly twice the speed, um, more energy was stored in the wheels and you had less of the real uh, velocity showing up in the linear motion. The linear motion was more retarded by the amount of energy stored in rotating the wheels. And that's the that's what accounts for this difference. <clears throat> so he claimed that kinetic energy was, um, you know, because it was only 8% off or something, that kinetic energy was conserved when, no, it wasn't. Momentum was conserved. It's just that you're not counting all of the momentum. And that's the simple answer. Um, and that's the cheat. And so... <clears throat> You know, people have accused me of conspiracy theories and different things, but you do have to ask yourself the question, why would this company that sells these carts for the purpose of doing low friction, linear velocity experiments, why would they design carts that have little tiny metal wheels? Why wouldn't they design the carts to have very light wheels? Uh, you know, as light as possible to take as less of to distract as little as possible from linear motion. So you know, it's a valid question. Why are the carts designed the way they are, if the intent is to observe the linear motion, not the wheel track? Uh, you know, energy. And um, the simple answer is is that because this works, this makes the experiment turn out the way they want it to. Not the truth. It doesn't show the truth. It shows what they're arguing is the truth. <laughs> it, it, um, and so it's a contrivance. It's a deliberate, willful effort to bend the experiment in the direction of revealing the truth, the outcome uh, that they, their book says is supposed to happen. So they're forcing it to happen. Now, how overtly that lie is, I mean, whether or not there's actual emails between company employees saying, well, it doesn't work if we use light wheels. It doesn't come out the way the physicists want it to. So let's just do whatever it takes to make it turn out the way they want it to turn out. Because we can't sell the product unless it does what they want it to do. Or where they said, oh, uh, the truth is the physics is garbage, um, you know, so, but, yeah, so let's just do whatever we want because we don't care that it's, the, it's garbage physics. Um, you know, you have to wonder why NASA doesn't do the Eddington experiment, doesn't even talk about redoing it, doesn't even think about the idea of taking one of its 40 satellites that are analyzing the sun and actually see if they can see any of that lensing crap. I mean, it's all such a deception. You know, why don't they just come out and say, yes, we landed on the moon using momentum because that's the only thing that works. Kinetic energy wouldn't tell us the truth. We would time our thrust and we'd get a wrong answer about what our 
spaceship's reaction would be. It's just an absolute, look, it's just an absolute truth that momentum only works. You want to push a something in space, you have to use momentum <laughs> because kinetic energy won't mean anything because kinetic energy doesn't produce the equal and opposite reaction. I won't get the same jewels with the bullet and the recoiling gun. The answers are different. They don't obey the third law. And the only way you can move something is it has to obey the third law. <laughs> if it doesn't obey that, then it's not going to help you to create thrust or to throw something or to do anything. None of that can mean anything except in the context of being obedient to Newton's third law. And the only thing that obeys the third law is momentum. Kinetic energy violates it all over the place. So this really shouldn't be an argument among adults, frankly. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, I'm stuck on, uh, you know, the perpetual kindergarten of planet Earth. And so um, this will have to go on for years and years. But it's just very disappointing because people like physicist Michael could actually force this issue. He, he's a physicist. He has some credibility. He can make statements and people will pay attention. And until a physicist steps up and says, yeah, our physics is flawed, it's really not as tight as we are pretending it is that these are real questions that really haven't been answered and haven't been resolved and um, you know it, it, they're just cheating I mean again the ballistic pendulum they lose 99.94 percent of the kinetic energy and they can't admit well shit with all of our technology we should be able to do better than 99.4 you know, only 0 0.06. We should be able to do a lot better than that in collecting this tremendous amount of kinetic energy we claim exists. We claim the 2,000 joules exist and we're collecting less than 1.7. Now, we have to be able to say, why the fuck are we so inept at turning all of that energy into work? Why can't we do it? You know, and, and explain why can't we stick a thermometer in the ballistic pendulum and find out if there's thousands of joules of heat in there. Because that's what their theory says. And they should be able to prove it. They should be willing to prove it. And clearly they're willing to do none of these real experiments. The only experiment they'll do are the ones they can contrive. The ones they can manipulate to come out their way. And they still... As far as we know to this date, no physicist has ever done a nice clinical experiment dropping four pounds one foot and one pound four feet. That was the axiom. The claim is that those two things are equal energy, equal force, equal capacity to do work. And it was made 350 years ago and it was never backed up with any experimental evidence. That should bother a scientist. And the fact that it doesn't, that should bother you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Enough of a video. So, till the next time and such and so forth and whatnot. I can only play my part. I can't play yours for you. I can't say, oh, I'm going to be an honest person and say, yes, these are valid questions and they really should be answered with decisive evidence. I can't read the script for you, okay? You have to read it. You have to do something. You have to react. You do nothing, then nothing happens. <laughs>